what is coming next, to also to think about what is going on now, how we can use what is going on now to shed light on, on previous parts of American history. And I'll stop there and, and um, look forward to, to hearing your questions about that later. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's gonna be hard to follow that one. So I would like to pick up from, I'd say around the mid 1960s. I know when I discuss with my students and I try and get them thinking about what this, how the selection, uh, what's really at stake here, I tend to want to look at the previous 14 presidential elections. And we can start, you were mentioning uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. And I would like to start right around there because in 1964, uh, less than a year after the assassination of President Kennedy, the power of the Democratic Party was pretty much at its peak. Uh, you had President Johnson, he had just signed the Historic Civil Rights Act into law, uh, I think it was that July. And as a result, we see Johnson in that election in 64, just trouncing, who was then the ultra conservative Barry Goldwater in, at that time, what was the most lopsided popular vote margin in presidential election history. Now, you fast forward four years later and 1968, America is just divided socially. Uh, in fact, we, we've heard comparisons between what's going on now to socially what was going on in America in the, in the late 1960s. And 68 was an extremely tumultuous year for that uh, for the country. You've had Martin Luther King assassinated. You had Robert Kennedy, who was assassinated. Protests were raging with the war in Vietnam, and as a result, Johnson suggests he's not going to run for re-election. He's not seeking his party's uh, nomination. As a result of this, you're getting a major political realignment as Richard Nixon, who's now the Republican candidate, takes advantage of what's, what has become the racial resentment at that time. You had the segregationist George Wallace, who was uh, an independent, uh, he was a major beneficiary of this, winning most of the uh, states in the Deep South. Uh, the backlash, though, was very strong amongst these Democrats who were essentially these segregationists in the South, and they had felt that the Democratic Party had left him. Now, this would open the door for Richard Nixon and his Southern strategy. I would also want to note in 1968, you would hear Richard Nixon campaigning that he was the law and order candidate, something you are very much hearing today. So, uh, it, you know, what's old is now new again. Um, at the same time, you had some of that backlash over uh, Johnson's Great Society programs and ways to fight poverty. It's not until 1972 that this realignment is on full display and you have George McGovern running. Uh, he... Nixon just demolished him, winning 49 states. Uh, at the same time, you've had George Wallace, who was back, and he had been shot, paralyzed from the waist down. And uh, Nixon wins from what you can call one of the largest electoral college victories of any presidential election. Um, you had Watergate, uh, the fallout from that, Nixon resigning. And the fallout from that was on full display in 1976. You had Gerald Ford, who was Nixon's vice president, is now running for his own term in office, and he's running against Jimmy Carter. Now, the interesting thing about this election, Jimmy Carter had campaigned on being, you know, an outsider. He's not a Washington elite. Uh, I'll never lie to you. That was something he had said on the campaign trail. And he wins the election. Jimmy Carter, though, is kind of plagued. You have high inflation, you have a stagnant economy, and at this time, uh, you have the Iranian hostage situation taking place. And Jimmy Carter just proved to be, as he's now painted by his opponent in 1980, uh, Republican, former Republican Governor Ronald Reagan, as just an ineffective president. And Ronald Reagan, it, this is also important to note as well, and I think you see the Republican Party of today 
was in a very different place in 1980. You can make the argument that in, in the late 70s, the Republican Party arguably had been the party of ideas. Uh, we had seen a misapplication of the Keynesian approach to the economy, which you can argue created that uh, high inflation stagnant economy. And at this time, the Republicans were opposed to anything that would add to the national debt. This is when, in true fashion, they were true fiscal hawks. They did not want to introduce any new spending that would add to the debt. So go up to Jack Kemp's office, who is a, uh, a congressman here from New York. He was working on a bill with Senator uh, Roth, and they would create what's called the Kemp-Roth bill. And this was a new approach towards the economy at that time, which Ronald Reagan embraces. And this Kemp-Roth bill would become Reaganomics, essentially. And in 1980, you have Reagan running, and he was the king of one-liners. Ronald Reagan would say, a recession is when your neighbor loses his job, a depression is when you lose yours, and recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his. And this would resonate. You know, he would dub his, uh, his presence, you know, morning in America, you know, we're breathing new life and it's a restart. You know, we are that shining city. So he offers this optimistic vision of America and his policies early on do help bring down inflation with the help of the Fed Reserve raising interest rates. Uh, as a result of that, we would see unemployment drop as well. And he becomes a wildly popular president. There was an assassination attempt on him. And <laughs> it's also worth noting that when he was on the operating table, uh, he had said, I hope uh, you're all Republicans. And the doctor said, well, today, sir, everyone is a Republican in this room. So he had become wildly popular. And four years later, Walter Mondale, uh, he was fighting an uphill battle against Reagan because he was enorm you know, immensely popular. And Walter Mondale selects Geraldine Ferraro as his uh, vice presidential uh, candidate to run alongside him. Uh, this is not, we've seen since Geraldine Ferraro, two other females uh, running on the presidential ticket as vice presidents, one of them being Sarah Palin from Alaska, the former governor there, and we'll, we'll get to her in a second. But Ronald Reagan wins his 1984 election and over the next four years, there's a bit of controversy with Reagan. And you're starting to see some of those Republican ideas kind of running stale a bit. And that's on display in the 1988 election, when even though George H.W. Bush, and we'll call him Bush 41, does come out with a nice electoral victory, the popular vote was kind of by a slim margin. So you're kind of seeing the Republican Party somewhat falling out of favor in terms of popularity with the American people. But he defeats Michael Dukakis, who was the uh, governor up in Massachusetts. And George H.W. Bush needed a definitive line. And his campaign manager at the time, I believe his name was Lee Atwater, had said, you need a good one-liner. And George H.W. Bush says, read my lips, no new taxes. And at this time, you have the Soviet Union in decline. You also have an economy that's entering a recession. And Bush is believed to, he will be carrying on what's become known as the Reagan Revolution. And when he gets into office, he looks at America's balance sheet, balance sheet essentially, and says, you know, we cannot be the world's superpower leading if we're gonna continuously run massive budget deficits and increase the national debt. And he's forced to go back on his pledge of no new taxes. And he signs into law what's called the 1990 Budget Enforcement Act. And it's this act which actually sets up Clinton for the budget surpluses he's gonna benefit from in the late 1990s. Uh, but in 1992, uh, President Bush, Bush 41, is coming off of huge victory from the Persian Gulf War, the end of the Cold War, but he's plagued with a massive recession that's happening in the United States. Uh, unemployment was on the rise, wages had been stagnant, and then he's met with a third party candidate, Ross Perot. And 
this, the turnout of this election, Bush only gets 37% of the popular vote. Clinton wins 43%. The first time we've seen this since I believe Woodrow Wilson, I want to say, someone not breaking 50% of the popular vote. And uh, Clinton, his campaign was very interesting because he is running on this campaign idea of invest in people. You know, this whole departure of the supply side rule and economics, you know, the Republicans, you know, they had won in 80, 84 and 88, the first time in post-World War II, in the post-World War II era, we see a party winning three consecutive elections. And Bill Clinton breaks that streak and has, he's this young governor from Arkansas. Although Bush felt he did not have a good shot at winning, he felt someone coming into the election with that much, uh, that much, uh, I don't want to say corruption, but Clinton was plagued with scandals going on while he was governor, before he became president. And Bush did not think that would resonate well with voters. But as it turns out, Clinton does win the election. And what Clinton does, in 1993, he submits his budget to Congress, and what he does is essentially double down on what George H.W. Bush signed in 1990, and that helps lead to the budget, the balanced budget we see in 1997, and the budget surpluses uh, throughout the late 1990s into 2000. And the 1990s are a time of relative peace. There's no more Cold War. America is you know, the quote unquote sole superpower in the world leading the way. And uh, in 1996, they put up the uninspiring Bob Dole, uh, who is the nominee for the Republicans for president. And uh, Clinton, you know, wins re-election too. Now he is the first president, I wanna say, to win two terms without crossing the 50% threshold. 